This is section 4.6, directional derivatives, which is the main topic of today. And then we're going to talk about properties of gradients and a little bit about level curves and how to find tangents to level curves. So we've already looked at the gradient before, but now we're looking at it formally in this section. If f of x, y is a function, then the gradient of f is a vector. And we either say del f or gradient of f. So let's just do an example here. Find del f for tangent inverse of y over x. So del f is, okay, I want f sub x and then f sub y. So this is just practice taking partials. If we take the partial of tangent inverse of this function with respect to x, then in the denominator, we have one plus the argument squared y squared over x squared. And in the numerator, we want the partial with respect to x. So that would be negative y over x squared, if you think of that as y times x to the negative 1. And then the partial with respect to y is going to have the exact same denominator, 1 plus y squared over x squared. But the numerator is a little simpler. The numerator is the partial of y over x with respect to y, which is just 1 over x. Okay, and now we want to clean that up. It's a complex fraction. So I'm going to multiply, in each case, I'm going to multiply by x squared over x squared to clear fractions. And so when I do that to the first guy, the numerator becomes negative y, and then the denominator, I have to distribute that x squared to the 1. That gives me x squared. And then I distribute the x squared to the y squared over x squared to get y squared. All right, now multiply the second fraction by x squared over x squared, and we get x on top, and the same thing on the bottom, x squared plus y squared. There's our gradient. And if we wanted to evaluate that at a point, then we would plug in the coordinates of the point for x and y. That's what we're going to do in the next example find del f at 0, 1 half pi. So first we just need del f, then we'll find del f at this point. So del f is going to be, now in this case, f is a function of three variables. So we want fx, fy, fz. All right, now partial with respect to x is easy, sine yz. Partial with respect to y, use the chain rule, we get x, x is a constant, cos yz times the, par times the derivative of yz with respect to y, which is z. So a z comes out, so I have xz in front, and then cos yz. And then the partial with respect to z, a y comes out, so I have xy cos yz. And then del f at the point 0, 1 half pi is, all right, we want sine of pi over 2, yz will be pi over 2, and then, so that will be 1, and then since x is 0, the next guy is going to be 0, and so is the last guy, so that's just going to give us 1, 0, 0. Okay, we're almost to the main topic of the day, which is directional derivative. We know the geometric significance of partial derivatives fx and fy, but suppose we want to let x and y both change. We don't want to slice with a, with a plane that's parallel to one of the coordinate axes. We want to slice with an oblique plane like the picture I have here. The, tan the slope of this, the curve that's formed here when I look at the tangent line, that's the geometric interpretation of a directional derivative. So for example, if your comfort level is a function of maybe temperature and humidity, then holding temperature constant and finding the derivative with respect to humidity would be a partial derivative. And holding humidity constant and finding the partial derivative with respect to temperature would be a partial. But suppose you want to let temperature and humidity both, say, increase like this, then we're getting a directional derivative. We're seeing how our uh, comfort level changes as we change the temperature in a certain way and the humidity in a certain way. Okay, how do you find this, this number? It's really easy. You take the gradient and you dot with the unit vector 
that goes in the direction where you want your directional derivative to point. So that would be in the plane. Here I have u, but it's really important that u is unit, meaning length 1. All right. And so I have three formulas here. I think the first one is the easiest to remember because it's so simple, but explicitly, you know, the second one kind of explains exactly what you have to do. And then the third one multiplies everything out. And if it turns out that the unit vector you use is either i or j, then the directional derivative turns out being just a partial with respect to x or a partial with respect to y. Okay, so let's do an example. Find the derivative of this function at the point 1, 2 in the direction of the vector v equal 1, 1. Okay, so we need the ingredients for this formula. First, we need del f. It's going to be 2x plus y comma. Partial with respect to y is just x. Now I need del f at the point in question, 1 comma 2. So x is 1, y is 2, so that gives me 4, 1. And so that's going to be up here in this first formula. This is, this is shorthand for del f at the point p dot u. So we found the first vector in our dot. For the second vector, we can't just use v because v is not a unit vector. So let's let u equal v over its length. Okay, the length of v is root 2, so that's 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. And then the notation is big D sub u of f at p, <laughs> the directional derivative of f in the direction of u at p, is the dot product of del f, which is 4, 1, and u, 1 over root 2, comma, 1 over root 2. So it's pretty easy to compute, actually. That gives us 5 over root 2. Okay, let's do another one. Here we have another function at a different point and in the direction of a different vector. So once again, we need to start with just del f partial with respect to x. Okay, we're going to be e to the y and then minus a y is going to come out sine xy comma partial with respect to y is x e to the y and then minus now an x comes out x sine of xy all right and now we want del f at p so at 2 0 x is 2 y is 0 so so i'm going to get 1 comma 2 all right and now we're going to let u be v over the length of v. The length of v is square root of 5, so 1 over root 5, comma 2 over root 5, and our directional derivative duf at p is the dot product, I'll write it down the formula, del f dot u, which is 1, 2, dot 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5. Okay, and that's 5 over root 5, aka root 5. So directional derivative is a number. Okay, how does directional derivative relate to gradient? Well, if you search back in your memory and think of, remember this formula that u dot v is length of u, length of v, cos theta. In the case of the directional derivative, length of u will be 1 because u is a unit vector. Cos theta is going to max out when theta is 0. So the directional derivative will be its largest when u goes in the direction of del f. So that's what's written right here. f is increasing most rapidly, meaning the directional derivative is its biggest, in the direction of del f. And its maximum value is just the, the length of del f. Conversely, this number is its smallest when theta is pi. And in that case, del f and u are pointing in opposite directions. So f is decreasing the most rapidly in the direction of negative del f. And to get the, the, the value of the directional derivative, just take the negative of the length of del f. That's a mouthful. OK, so let's see how this works. Find the maximum rate of change of this function at the point 2, 1. What we want is the length of del f at 2 comma 1 because we know the maximum rate of change 
is in the direction of del f, and this is its value. So that's what we want. All right, so let's start out. First, we need del f, and that's going to be, think of f as 4y to the fourth x to the negative 1. So the partial with respect to x, bring the negative down, we'll get negative 4y to the fourth over x squared. And then the partial with respect to y will be, tw not 12, 16y cubed over x. All right, and so we want del f at 2, 1. 2 squared is 4, so that's going to be negative 1, and then 8. And so the length of del f at 2, 1 is square root of negative 1 squared plus 8 squared, which is the square root of 65. Okay, and then this example is related to the one above. Find the direction of the maximum rate of change of the exact same function at the exact same point. Answer with a unit vector. Okay, so the direction, direction of max increase is del f at 2, 1, but we want a unit vector, so what we want is del f at 2, 1 divided by its length. Okay, so we've done all the work. We found del f at 2, 1, that's negative 1, comma 8, and actually we found its length too, that's root 65. So we want negative 1 over root 65, comma 8 over root 65. That's the direction of maximum increase. So this is the actual value of the derivative, and this is the direction in which it's increasing the most rapidly. Okay, last topic, level curves. So the key point about level curves are that the gradient will always be perpendicular to the level curve. So if you think about a topo map, the level curves represent curves where the elevation is constant. If you're, let's say, climbing a mountain outside of Exeter and you want to know what direction to go in so that you're always climbing the steepest part of the mountain, you're going up at the highest rate, you're going to go in the direction of the gradient at every point because every time you have a tangent line, the gradient will be perpendicular to that tangent line. I've got a proof of that here and it requires just the chain rule and so I'm going to let you read through that as your leisure at your leisure and I'm going to move on to an example. Here we have a function. Find the level curve that passes through negative 5, negative 1, and then find a unit vector, unit tangent vector, at that point with positive x component. So, so let's get worry about that in a minute. Let's just worry about the level curve right now. So if you recall, when you're trying to find a level curve that passes through a point, first you have to find c. Find c. And c is going to be f of the point in question, in this case negative 5, negative 1. And so that's 5 over 4. I'm going to square negative 5 to get 25. So and it's still minus, so minus 25 over 4. And then negative 1 I'm going to square to get positive 1, so minus 1 fourth. And that gives me negative 21 over 4. So once you find c, then to get the level curve, the level curve is defined by f of x, y equals c. So we set f of x, y, which is 5 quarters minus 1 quarter x squared minus 1 quarter y squared. We set that equal to c, negative 21 over 4. So let's multiply through by 4. 5 minus x squared minus y squared is negative 21. So if I want to recognize that as a circle, let's move the x squared and y squared to one side. x squared plus y squared would be positive 26. So there's our level curve. It's a circle centered at the origin of radius root 26. And I have that graphed in red. There's our circle. Okay, find a unit tangent vector. Well, del f will be perpendicular to the tangent line. So it will be perpendicular to the tangent vectors. So first let's find del f. Del f is, okay, I bring down the 2, so I get negative 1 half x, comma, and then negative 1 half y. 
and I want del f at p. p is negative 5, negative 1. And that is 5 halves comma 1 half. So that's that green vector that's graphed there. So there will be two vectors, two unit vectors that are orthogonal to that vector. And they'll both be tangent to the curve. This is going to be orthogonal to the curve. So any vector um, orthogonal to this vector will be tangent to the curve. Now up here, I've got a little cheat sheet for you. If a vector v is a, b, then a quick way to get two orthogonal vectors, just switch the components b and a and make one of them negative. So if this is my del f, two vectors orthogonal to del f are, I'll call them v1 and v2, just flip these two coordinates, make one negative. So negative one half, five halves, that will be orthogonal to del f and v2, switch these coordinates and make the other one negative. So positive one half, negative five halves. Those are both orthogonal to del f and they're both tangent to the curve. We want the one with positive x component. All right, so which one do we want? We want v2, but don't circle that because that's not the answer. We have to do one more thing. We need a unit tangent vector. So we want v2 over its length. So let's find the length of v2 over here. The length of v2 is the square root of 1 fourth plus 25 over 4, which is the square root of 26 over 4, which is square root of 26 over 2. So if I'm dividing by that number, I can multiply by 2 over the square root of 26 and take v2, 1 half comma negative 5 halves. And so that, if I clean that up, that's going to be positive 1 over root 26 and then negative 5 over root 26. That's 26. And the one nice thing about my open math is it doesn't require you to rationalize denominators, so you're fine with the square root in the denominator. All right, and that's the end of this section.